in either their organization or kind of relationship to South Hills Junction in the chat. That would be great just so we get a sense of who's here. Um, so then we will be moving into our presentation, which as I said through along the way, there will be um, some pauses for discussion during the presentation. We will then be doing um, an interactive mapping activity using social pinpoints. So I'll be doing just a brief kind of overview of how to use that map and the software. Um, and then we will be breaking out into two groups just to do the interactive mapping um, activity and then we'll come back together, uh, reconvene and conclude the meeting. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Breen Masiotra, our section manager of planning for some brief remarks. Thank you, Maura. Um, as she said, um, I'm Breen Masiotra. I'm the section manager of planning at Port Authority of Allegheny County. I oversee long range planning, corridor planning, and most importantly today, transit oriented communities planning. Um, our transit oriented communities program, which Maura will provide some more information on in a moment, um, conducts station area planning, and that's what we're here to talk about today, is what will a station area plan for South Hills Junction look like? So eventually what we're going to have at the end of this process is um, a conceptual plan for transit oriented development on this site some idea of the key improvements we want to make to station access and um, a, a plan for any station design uh, improvements that we'd like to undertake as an agency. This plan um, is building upon the 2011 Smart Trid plan. Um, some of you may be familiar with that plan or participated in that process several years ago. Um, that work is definitely valuable to us today. Um, it looked at the station area, um, again, about a decade ago. So we're looking at more current information now. Um, but it also, you know, looked at the at development opportunities outside of the Port, Port Authority property. And what we're really focused on in terms of redevelopment in this process is Port Authority's own property and how to how to ensure that that we're making the most of that, both for transit operations and for the community at large. Um, this plan is focused on one station area um, and is really focused as much on land use and facility design as it is, um, again, transit service. So um, it's, a, it's a sort of microcosm of the long range plan that we have ongoing. Um, the long range plan is a 25 year countywide look at our service and where um, we should make improvements to service or infrastructure in the future. Um, and um, this is, this is a, a different scale, um, but certainly um, aligned with what we hope to accomplish with the long range plan. Um, just a quick plug, we will have our final round of public meetings on the long range plan at the end of this month, May 24th and 25th. You can find out more about that. We'll put the, I'll put the link to um, the website for that project in the chat in case anyone wants to participate. So with that, I will turn it back over to Maura. All right, thanks Breen. Um, next slide, please. So before we dive into South Hills Junction, I'm just gonna give a quick overview of our transit-oriented communities program and kind of what we do uh, for the Port Authority. So um, we play a number of different roles in encouraging transit-oriented development in Allegheny County. And just so we're all on the same page as to what transit-oriented development actually is, um, it is development that is dense, um, it's mixed use. So there's you know commercial, office, residential, um, kind of all, it's part of the same development. Um, it's very walkable, easy to navigate. And of course it is high, is close to high quality transit. Next slide. So the Port Authority can play three different roles in transit oriented development or joint development. Um, the first is as a sponsor for joint development projects built on our property or physically or functionally connected to a busway um, or light rail port authority station. We can act as a stakeholder for any development that occurs within the kind of zone of influence of current or future stations, which is within a half mile radius. 
and we can act as an advocate for sustainable land use decisions along all of the Pittsburgh region's transit corridors. Next slide. So our TOC program consists of um, several kind of elements. Um, the first uh, TOD guidelines, these were created to provide stakeholders with best practices for transit oriented development. They're meant to guide planning decisions around transit and serve as a reference. Um, next is TOD zoning efforts. We worked with local municipalities as well as Connect to produce resources um, for zoning best practices. Um, also our first and last mile program, which provides support and advocacy for projects that help connect people to transit via other modes, such as biking and walking. Um, our station improvement program, which is what South Hills Junction is a part of. Um, this is planning for upgrades to our current stations to promote ridership and transit access. And finally, joint development, which is um, kind of how we participate in development, as I mentioned before, either as a stakeholder, um, a sponsor or advocate for joint development. Next slide. So the station improvement program, as I mentioned, this is um, our South Hills Junction planning process as part of this program. Um, it is the goal of the program is to invest capital resources in our light rail and busway stations in order to help catalyze or encourage transit oriented development to happen. Um, we started this by doing a station evaluation to identify where the greatest opportunities for TOD uh, is kind of along our, our fixed guideways. Um, and we've been kind of working our way down the list that was a result of that evaluation and creating station area plans for those stations. Um, so, so far we've done three plans. The first was for Negley Station. Construction is going to start on that station this summer. And we've done Station Square and Dormont Junction, which are currently going through architecture, the architectural design phases. And South Hills Junction, which is starting today, will be our fourth station area plan. Next slide. So that's just a very, very brief overview of all of our programs, but you can please visit our website um, to find out more. There are a ton of resources here. Um, and Sarah will be dropping a link in the chat here for, and she already did, Excellent. This is the link to our website. So please feel free to visit and um, stay up to date with uh, you know, what we're up to at TOC. Next slide. Okay, and that concludes uh, my little introduction phase. I'm now gonna hand it over to um, Elijah as part of the project team to start us off. Uh, thank you, Maura, uh, and good morning, everybody. My name is Elijah Hughes. I'm an urban planner with Evolve Environment Architecture. Uh, we're a subconsultant to uh, GAI consultants who are the lead on this project team. Uh, you'll get to meet uh, Rich and James later in the presentation uh, and speak with us in, in the breakout groups. Um, next slide, please. I'm going to start by talking about some of the station area context at uh, South Hills Junction Station. Uh, so next slide. Some of the things that we look at include uh, walkability and kind of the network reach of the station area. So on the left, you have a, a map of the areas that are walkable to the station. The places that are that are most walkable are in that kind of magenta and orange area. Everything within that orange area is within five minutes of a, of a walk uh, to the South Hills Junction station. Um, uh, now, uh, the light blue area around that is within a, a 10 minute walk or about half a mile uh, walk of the station area as well. And you can see that there's a, a difference between that perfect uh, magenta circle and that light blue area. That's because some areas within that half mile uh, radius of the station are further than a half mile to walk because of the uh, geometry of the street grid, but also some of these slopes of the walkways and, uh, and there are places where there are missing crosswalks or sidewalks that can make the area more walkable. So one of the things that we look at is connectivity. And so how, how can there be improvements in the surrounding context that make getting to the station uh, even easier? And this is one of the analysis that helps us determine that. On the right is, is what I think is what's most exciting about South Hills Junction Station is the network reach. There's a lot of transit here. All of the light rail vehicles in the system pass through South Hills Junction, but also many of the buses um, that serve the South Hills and some of the East End communities and even reaching up into uh, the North Shore pass through this area as well. And so you can see that, the, that from South Hills Junction, you can get to many, many, many places across the South Hills 
and well into the east end of Pittsburgh um, by, by using transit. Some, sometimes that requires a transfer, but you know all, everything that's in that shaded area in the map on the right, you can get to in, within 40 minutes by transit. Next slide. So another thing that we look at when, when we're uh, starting off a station area plan is what is the land use in the surrounding area? This helps us to determine how the station is being used, but also what kind of development might uh, be appropriate for this context if it turns out that there is developable property that, that Port Authority owns in the station area. Uh, so uh, there are uh, primarily two communities, um, two neighborhoods within the station area, Mount Washington and Beltsuver, but also a portion of Allentown. And the majority of the parcels that, that are within walking distance of the station are um, single family detached residential properties. Um, we, we do uh, also include portions of the Mount Washington and Allentown business districts within that half mile perimeter as well. One thing that you'll notice in the map at the left, if you, if you look really closely, is that there are several gray parcels and that uh, those are places within Belts Hoover um, where there are uh, vacant parcels within the station area. Next slide, please. Uh, so again, looking at, at the neighborhoods that are within that half mile area, but also some of the other um, uh, transit assets. So we're, we're looking at the different transit routes here. Uh, you can see um, a couple of landmarks, the South Hills Retirement Residence on top of the hill, uh, just above the station area. The iconic Liberty Tunnel Ventilation Towers are just above the station area as well. Within that half mile area, we also include um, the Palm Garden Station on the Red Line and the South Busway, as well as the Bog Station on the Blue Line and Silver Line. And there are a couple of circulator uh, on-street bus routes that pass through the neighborhoods as well. Next slide, please. So this is a look at the Mount Washington neighborhood. Uh, in Mount Washington, we have a strong urban residential fabric, a, a, a not, not too many missing teeth. Uh, and by missing teeth, I mean vacant parcels in between the homes. It's very dense, it's very walkable. Um, the residents are, the residences are, are in decent shape and the, the sidewalks are generally clear with well-marked sidewalks and crosswalks. Next slide, please. Uh, in Belts Hoover, um, some of the things that we noticed were, you know, there's an artistic neighborhood character, a lot of public art on, on some of the buildings within along the main drag. Um, there are uh, clear pedestrian walkways in many places, though in some places we did notice um, that there could be uh, some improvement to those uh, sidewalks. Um, and there are a lot of infill opportunities within the residential fabric, a lot of vacant parcels that are an opportunity for uh, potentially some new homes within that community. Next slide, please. Uh, just up the hill uh, along Warrington Avenue is the, the Allentown Business District. It's a very active, very diverse business district. Strong artistic character here as well with um, uh, a, a lot of public art on the sides of buildings and, and along the main drag. Um, and it's, it's a very walkable community uh, uh, within uh, a 10 minute walk of the station area. Um, I'm following along at home and I lost my place in the slide deck. Pardon me. Um, so looking at the historical context, this has always been a junction uh, dating back to when, uh, you know, the, the rails were actually built for uh, moving coal. All of our hilltops have coal underneath and, and these ones are no different. Um, over time, those coal tunnels and those coal rail lines became useful for moving people as well. And, uh, and and ultimately it became the center of operations for all of our different transit lines uh, across the, the South Hills. Um, and so it was not just a junction between those transit lines, it was also a storage area. And so you can see in the photos at the bottom um, that this is where the streetcars kind of lived and were taken care of and maintained um, and where they uh, were staged uh, for uh, rush hour traffic and uh, and really operating the entire streetcar system. One thing that is kind of significant about that is that people didn't really have a need to walk into the valley. Uh, the valley was really kind of an off limits, unwelcoming space for most of its existence um, uh, because of uh, all of this transit infrastructure. 
When we converted from light rail to from streetcar to light rail, um, a lot of those streetcar routes where people would board in the neighborhood uh, were converted to bus routes. And so if people wanted to get onto the light rail, they had to enter into the valley. And that is when this station area was, was built, was um, in the uh, 70s and 80s. Although this, the station platforms that are there today were renovated in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, but the, what's significant about that is that the the access points into the valley were never really designed for people to uh, uh, really kind of enjoy entering into this space. Um, they were kind of a, a, uh, um, a, a leftover pathway uh, to access the station area. And so one of, one of the things that James will talk about quite a bit is how can we improve the access points to be more accessible, uh, but also more attractive, welcoming, and safe. Next slide, please. So another thing that we look at is what is the history of the, the economic development fabric? And, um, and so we talked about earlier, the land use in this area is primarily residences. Now, back in the 1930s, there was um, a, a program called the Homeowners Loan Corporation, which essentially, this is, this is redlining. And what they would do is they would demarcate different neighborhoods and give those different neighborhoods a different level of access to capital with which they could use to buy homes, but also to improve their homes. And so the lower grades did not have the same access to capital as the higher grades. And this has led to a lot of uh, major long-term chronic social justice issues over the years. In this neighborhood, uh, you know, historically, this was a grade C neighborhood, which had a, a strong racial mix, but it also had unpaved streets, poor construction quality relative to some other neighborhoods, and steep terrain. And so at that time, uh, the, there were limitations placed on what kind of lending could take place here. Over time, that, that led to a certain level of disinvestment in both the Mount Washington and Beltsuber neighborhoods, um, and it, it led to a kind of lower quality of housing stock uh, during that time, uh, but also it, it made it harder for people who lived in those neighborhoods to build family wealth because they didn't have the same access to capital that other communities had. Next slide, please. So um, when we're performing a plan, we crunch a lot of different data. Um, and so there are a couple of data points that stuck out to us as being important for the Mount Washington, Belt, Hooper, and Allentown neighborhoods within this station area. Uh, one of them, you know, Port Authority is a transit agency. They're interested in knowing how many people are actually using transit. Um, and so that in the lower left-hand corner of each of these tables, you see the non-auto commuters. Um, in general, citywide, 44% of people use transit or, or are non-auto commuters. In Mount Washington, that is lower than average at 38%. In Bell's Hoover, it's lower than average at 40%. So those are both opportunities for improvement uh, by making the Port Authority's facilities easier to access, more comfortable and more convenient. Perhaps more people will choose uh, not to use their car to commute. In the Allentown, it's just a touch above average. So we're doing a little better in Allentown. Um, a, a really significant data point that we're also interested in is the percentage of cost burden renters. How many people um, is, you know, for how many people in a given neighborhood is rent, um, you know, preventing them from living their best lives uh, because rent is a cost burden on their lives. Uh, citywide, it's 20%. In all three of these neighborhoods, we are above that citywide average. In Mount Washington, it's almost double at 38%. In Belts Hoover, it's three times at 60%. And at Allentown, it's about two and a half times at 50%, 49%. Uh, so there is room for improvement there. That helps us to uh, kind of understand if we were to develop something at South Hills Junction Station and what we were to develop were to include residential, is it important for us to really consider how to make that residential property affordable uh, and inclusive? And so we definitely see a need for that uh, based on this data point. Um, lastly, a, another really interesting point uh, for, for the uh, kind of urban designing uh, and, and planning nerds is the intersection density. Um, so what that tells us is when you have more uh, intersections within a square mile, in general, your urban fabric, the fabric of all the streets is more dense. Um, the, there are more roadways intersecting, 
more different ways that you can walk around. And so it's an analog for how walkable is this neighborhood. The Pittsburgh citywide average is 175 intersections per square mile. All three of these neighborhoods are above that. So we, we definitely have a greater, uh, a denser urban fabric with a greater degree of walkability. Um, in particular, Allentown is really high at 410 intersections per square mile. And when you look at a map of Allentown, you can see all of these different alleys and, and the intersections between these alleys mean that there are a lot of different ways that you can move through uh, that particular community. But Belts Hoover and Mount Washington are also above that average. Next slide, please. Um, so Port Authority owns quite a bit of property in this valley. Uh, if you recall back at the historical background slide, this is where all of the different streetcar lines came together. Uh, well, it's also where all of those streetcar lines were maintained. It's where they laid over their vehicles. And when the Port Authority was created in the 1960s, all of that property that belonged to the streetcar lines was conveyed to Port Authority ownership. And Port Authority maintains that ownership uh, even today. Uh, many of the facilities in the valley are maintenance facilities. Um, there are uh, six significant buildings along that site, as well as uh, parking areas and storage areas for the Port Authority. Um, and this is kind of the, this is the separation between um, the Mount Washington and Belts Hoover neighborhoods. Um, we're focused most in intensely, if you go to the next slide, on this uh, area up in the uh, kind of upper right or the northeast area of this site. And this is where um, Haberman and, and Warrington Avenue come together on the right, and it's where the station area is on the left. Uh, what's there today is you have the, the uh, South Hills Junction Station, you have a rail tie storage area, uh, you have a salt dome, which is where Port Authority uh, uh, stores all of its salt to maintain the entire network. Um, and it's also where there's a, a bus layover facility. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to take a, a quick sip of water here. Thank you. I'm going to talk a little bit about a previous plan that was uh, that was made in this area in 2011. Uh, some of you may uh, remember this planning process. This was the 2011 Smart Trade Corridor Study. It included the South Hills Junction uh, Station area, but it also included uh, uh, the on-street portions of the red line uh, through Beachview. So next slide, please. That was a very interactive and in-depth planning process. I, I really encourage folks to uh, look back through a lot of the recommendations. Uh, many of the recommendations that have to deal with the transit facilities and the infrastructure of the neighborhood remain relevant today. Um, however, there are also recommendations and analysis about economic conditions and potential development. Uh, because the economic conditions have changed, those recommendations um, and analysis uh, should really be reevaluated. The city has changed a lot in the past 10 years, and so the kinds of development that would be appropriate today would be different than what they were looking at back in 2011. Um, of particular relevance to what we're looking at now, uh, based on the feedback that that planning process gathered, um, were, were two kind of uh, big categories of things. Improved connectivity to the station area from surrounding neighborhoods was the number one uh, comment that came back through that planning process. And a lot of the recommendations from that planning process have to deal with improving connectivity. Uh, the other was that um, uh, members of both the Mount Washington and Belts Hoover communities were interested in seeing new mixed use development and retail at Port Authority's South Hills Junction site um, that could serve both the community and commuters. Um, the kinds of retail facilities they were interested in at the time um, were things like community centers or um, convenience stores or pharmacies. Um, but there was also a strong focus on uh, a, a lot of other retail as well. Uh, the retail marketplace was um, uh, much stronger at that point in 2011. Uh, next slide, please. So with those ideas uh, in mind, uh, that planning study came up with three development scenarios for the same project area that we're looking at today. Uh, 
Um, the first scenario uh, was the, uh, the kind of simplest scenario without any structured parking. It was all surface parking. It included a 20,000 square foot uh, community healthcare or recreational facility, 50 units of multifamily apartment housing, and 25 units of townhome housing. Uh, the, the next development scenario added a parking garage, a 165 space parking garage, and included no surface parking. Uh, it included 85,000 square feet of retail, which is quite a bit. That's a lot of retail space. Um, a, a, about the same number of units of apartments and about the same number of units of townhomes. Um, and then scenario three took that a little bit further and said, we're going to use the same 165 space structured parking garage, but also include a, a large surface parking lot. And that would bump up the amount of retail to 127,000 square feet of retail space. When we look at this today, um, the conditions are, are a little bit different um, in terms of you know, what the market can support. Um, I think the uh, kind of conventional wisdom um, of today's marketplace would say that this is too much retail space that they're, that they're allotting um, and actually not enough residential space. Um, but we'll, uh, you know, later on in the study process, you know, well after this, uh, today's meeting, uh, we'll dig into the economics of that, um, and we'll listen to your feedback as well about the kinds of development that might be appropriate here. The relationship between the transit infrastructure and the development is important because in some cases that development can help to subsidize and help to fund uh, better improvements, uh, not just to the station area, but also within the surrounding community. Things like sidewalks, crosswalks, um, lighting, benches, trash cans, these are all things that can uh, in part be supported uh, by certain levels of development. Next slide, please. So we're going to take a brief pause here. Um, I, I want to let folks know that we are uh, watching the chat, making note of every comment and question that comes up through the chat. Um, we also have an online interactive map platform um, through which we will be collecting feedback today, but also uh, we encourage you to share it with your neighbors into the future. But I do want to take a pause and see if there are any questions that we can answer. Um, and we'd, we'd ask that you save your uh, comments uh, for later in the presentation. Elijah, this is Karen. One of the questions that came up in the chat was about the data about the study area context, the data that's behind that study area context slide. Um, so for folks who aren't looking in the chat, um, there was discussion that it's census data and the city of Pittsburgh's forging Pittsburgh data. But I wondered, Elijah, whether you wanted to speak to um, the issue of the data behind um, that slide on study area context. Sure. Um, so the slide with the uh, with the tables on it. Let me pull yes. that up on my own screen. Um, so this is this is generally based on census data, uh, and I believe that um, Sarah, who is on today's call and and is with the Port Authority, uh, can let us know if that's based on the 2010 or 2020 census data. Um, and some of this is is also um, from as as you mentioned the uh, forging PGH comprehensive plan that uh, the Department of City Planning is currently working on uh, through their study process. They're bringing together a whole host of different data sources um, and compiling them into a, a kind of unified database of background data for each community. Um, some of the other data that we're also using is from a uh, vendor called Urban Footprint. And that takes a lot of this data um, from the census, but also from many other sources, and it, it uh, estimates it down to the parcel level. So if there are a certain number of residential parcels within a community, based on the size of the parcel, based on the zoning of the parcel, it will estimate, we believe, that about 3.2 people live uh, you know, within uh, this parcel. Uh, and so some of the more specific uh, queries that we have with regard to how many jobs uh, 
can you access or how many people could walk to this retail establishment or how many real retail establishments could somebody walk to from their home um, use that urban footprint data uh, which is broken down instead of to the census tract level it's broken down to the individual parcel level great thank you Well, if there are no other kind of clarifying questions, we can probably move on to the next portion. Thanks, Maura. Um, hello, everyone. My name is James Jost. I am with uh, GAI Consultants and their Community Solutions Group. Uh, I am a landscape architect and planner uh, as part of this project, and I'm going to walk you through some of the site context that we were able to uh, observe as we've done our site visits and also met with the Port Authority team on site. And some just kind of cover some of the opportunities constraints as well that we have uh, been able to visualize and discern as we've been on site. So starting off with our gateways. So we have completed a full review of the existing gateways for the uh, and previous gateways into the stationary that were conducted. Uh, upon our review, we found six active points of entry into the station with one or to three having been already closed. Uh, those closed access points include a singular stair coming from Parr Street with two additional points of access joining that stair at Albert Street. The existing gateways include an additional access from Mount Washington uh, with three direct stairs connecting to the station area from Jasper Street, Layla Street, and Harwood Way, uh, reaching up to Sacane. Uh, connection to the station from Beltsufer here uh, also have three points of access. However, only one currently has a designated crosswalk uh, connecting to the neighborhood. Uh, those include uh, connection at West Warrington Avenue, which is the pedestrian access ramp to the bottom uh, left of your screen. Uh, the Montooth Street stair, which is the only point that actually has a marked crosswalk and that's centrally located on uh, the south at what um, along West uh, Warrington as well. And then on East Warrington Avenue at the intersection of Haberman, uh, which is also the main entry if you were to come uh, from Allentown. Uh, so looking at these directly, we were able to highlight the Layla Street stair. Uh, here we have an updated staircase. Uh, this has clear sight lines to the station platforms presenting a comfortable access point. Um, uh, as it has access into the station. We've also visited this station at night to kind of analyze the lighting. And what we were able to find is that most of the fixtures um, on the site have been retrofitted with LEDs, making these feel more comfortable and safe as you enter the, the station area. Next, looking at Jasper Street stair, we could see that this is an older point of access with less clear sight lines to the station area. Uh, this also presents a lack of wayfinding and identifying this as a gateway to the station itself. Uh, next, we looked at Harwood Way. Uh, we can see that at this point, there are no station area identifiers, uh, making this point of access feel uncertain to those who might be looking for the station, especially if you're not used to using this as a point of access. Uh, in review of our southern gateways, uh, we'll start at the War Warrington Haberman intersection. So here, uh, this area we realized could be a bit confusing to maybe new users as it might feel like an entry to the operation and maintenance facility. Uh, thus, it's a, a bit of a less welcoming atmosphere as you're entering the station. Uh, multiple vehicular signs also make this seem like an area where pedestrians are not welcome with things such as the lack of crosswalks at the intersection and additional pedestrian markings and signage could deter users from using this as a point of access. Uh, looking at the Monteith Street stair, again, our only, uh, this is again the only marked crosswalk from going over Warrington Avenue connecting Belts Hoover neighborhood to the station area, clearly. Uh, the stair does show signs of visible repair need However, it does provide a clear sight line to the bus loop and control tower. So you at least know that you are entering the station area when you are gaining access from this point. And then lastly, looking at the pedestrian ramp as it connects the station platforms to the on-street bus routes at Warrington and Boxton. 
Uh, however, this area is also showing signs of uh, repair needed, including how the channel has storm infrastructure, channeling down here, um, directly filters out onto the ramp leading down to the station, how that could possibly present issues whenever there are heavy rain events or maybe even winter when you have icing on these pathways. Um, again, we did uh, do a full stationary review at night to analyze the lighting, and we just kind of wanted to tile these so you could see what that kind of looks like uh, for each of the gateways and some of the internal circulation. Uh, with the upgraded LED lighting that the authority has gone in and done, it did make the area feel much more comfortable and a more lit uh, experience, so it is uh, does feel safer when you are down there and when you're experiencing at night, uh, just from our general observation. Now, going into the site circulation, this map actually builds onto what we have identified with the gateways and how pedestrians and vehicles move throughout the station area. Uh, what we're able to observe here is how the station's platforms uh, present multiple points of conflict between the two. As we look towards developing concept scenarios for the stations, we want to develop better circulation patterns, which can reduce some of the conflict areas and improve the circulation for the station users. What we're also able to observe, observe is the complexity of bus stops within the station and how they might be better positioned within the South Hills Junction and the light rail platforms to make an easier user experience as you're in the site itself. Additionally, we reviewed the slope and terrain um, within the site. It's obvious to examine how the general topography of the station and how it sits within that deep bowl between uh, Mount Washington and Belts Hoover really creating a barrier between these two neighborhoods. Uh, what we are interested to find is, is finding opportunities for better access points from the neighborhoods, as well as determine potential areas of development and how the terrain can affect potentially their cost when we're looking at that. But we also look at topography when we're actually looking at the hydrology. So that map directly relates to this one. Um, and how this and how uh, we can see how the site directly flows, uh, the, all the surface drain directly flows into sawmill run watershed. Using this data, we can actually establish where possible solutions for stormwater reductions on site can be best uh, used, uh, as well as move into, moving into the next phase and begin developing conceptual designs. We are interested as to how we can utilize green infrastructure. Uh, within the development and ultimately reduce the amount of stormwater infiltrating the watershed too quickly. Uh, next, we're just going to kind of uh, visit uh, what we have analyzed as we have gone on to the site and what we've kind of determined with our meetings with authority staff to date. Um, as we move through these next slides, we'll cover several um, opportunities and constraints, but once we move into our discussion, we're really interested to hear from you as to what some other possibilities at South Hills Junction uh, offers and what other uh, can, you might consider development constraints as you're working to develop it, or as we're looking to develop this plan. So starting with the salt shed area, uh, this area presents itself as a potential site for future transit-oriented development. Uh, this looks, uh, this should include some affordable housing opportunities as well as create better uh, ADA connection to the neighborhoods and the station area as we look to how this area might be able to better connect to Mount Washington. Uh, we recognize that the current salt facilities are under capacity for the authority uh, and this would allow them to expand their operations if they do so move that in order to allow for development. Uh, however, since re uh, relocation of the facilities would be needed, we do realize this as an added cost to the authority and thus presents itself as a possible constraint to consider. Uh, again, uh, the rail tile laydown area presents itself as an opportunity for development for affordable housing, as well as uh, the street development and uh, stationary activation. Uh, as this land sits directly facing Warrington Avenue, we see how this is a great infill opportunity for the neighborhoods uh, and something that can generate act activity on site, thus making it a bit more safer in the evening hours. Uh, as this area bridges the terrain, we also could benefit the access issues from Warrington uh, to the station area. So actually bridging that gap from Warrington down to the station area, creating a maybe more direct path uh, that would be ADA friendly. Uh, again, this site would need to be relocated and thus a relocation cost is something that we have to consider as a constraint in development. Uh, also, the potential excavation and potential site remediation cost 
uh, could be a bit prohibitive for future development, but we still think it's valid to actually look into this as a good site uh, for TOD. Uh, looking at the connection at uh, Warrington Avenue, as station users move down into the site from Haberman and Warrington intersection, they move past uh, several operational facilities and the first bus transit stops at South Hills Junction. Uh, this area has potential to become stronger gateway for riders and has the ability to utilize the existing retaining wall as maybe potentially public art installation. Uh, we also have the existing light rail infrastructure for Warrington Avenue detour here and how that might be addressed in other plans as to maybe looking at how that connector could work. Uh, as we do look at possible constraints, we, uh, that wall does present itself as a barrier and it creates a narrow walkway uh, and it may be potentially uncomfortable feeling as you're walking down to the station area, so we do need to address that. Uh, we also can see that stair access point coming down from Washington, and we see that need for better access uh, into that neighborhood from here. Um, now looking at the opposite direction at the staff parking and transit tunnel, the authority is already looking at plans to develop and remove uh, the M loop around the bus loop and control tower area. This presents us with the opportunity to reduce the conflict areas we spoke of earlier and improve site circulation and connectivity. Uh, noting the Warrington Avenue detour service on the last slide, we also can see how the opportunity to introduce a rail Y could improve the connection from the transit tunnel to Warrington Avenue in the future. Here we observe riders also not following the path as a possible constraint uh, along the wall, as is not the clear way to the station platforms and kind of creating a desired uh, trail through the staff parking parking lot. Uh, this area is potentially dangerous road crossing and additional conflict areas to take into consideration. Uh, while visiting the site at night, it, this was an area that was noted as being underlit as these wall mounted lights are currently also not functioning. Uh, and then lastly, we've been made aware of possible or several electrical utilities running underground in this area uh, that are using the transit tunnel to connect to downtown. Uh, so this could be a potential major constraint as we look at development, maybe in this uh, parking lot area. Uh, and now at the station platforms, uh, here we realize the high visibility of the station as this is the gateway to the South Hills from downtown. Uh, we also see how possible connections to the light rail platform and the South uh, busway could better be connected to create a more user friendly station area with the upgraded signage and wayfinding which the Port Authority is developing at this time as well. Uh, as we look at the constraints, we can see the pedestrian vehicular conflicts at this area. The platforms themselves might also be considered confusing to new riders uh, as we have multiple to choose from. Uh, also, uh, with the station platforms, uh, the way they sit within the site, there are no eyes on the station late at night and can be potentially seen as unsafe or unfriendly for anyone who's waiting on bus and transit. And then lastly, we'll look at kind of the streetscape and connections from Warrington Avenue. Here we have the opportunity to better connect the bus and rail transit as we look at transfer service. Uh, there is also the opportunity to review and advocate for better uh, streetscaping along Warrington Avenue to develop safer pedestrian crossings from Belts Hoover and help reduce observed speeds along Warrington as well. With that, we realize that we are constrained by the artillery roadway and rather have difficult pedestrian connections as it is today. Uh, these are rather important upgrades for the overall safety of pedestrians uh, utilizing the station and getting residents to and from Belts Hoover. Uh, next, we'll kind of just look at a quick map to showcase the transit-oriented development sites that we're currently looking at, but are looking for your feedback to kind of help guide us as we move into conceptual design. Uh, so highlighted in the orange, we are identifying the three zones for potential development as we see today. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we are looking at the same areas noted within the smart trid, uh, those being the salt shed area, the rail tie laydown area, and the staff parking site as it sits where the bus loop currently is. And these as these areas were studied back in 2011, we understand that the economics have changed drastically within the past 10 years and future development of these sites are in need to be revisited within this plan. 
The authority also has their own goals and objectives when it comes to transit oriented development. So we want to take that into consideration as they look at making these plans more reality as they have done with the past three plans that we have been working on before. Um, so we want to make sure that we kind of focus and look at how we can utilize these three sites as uh, future development and TOD that best benefit the neighborhood and bringing what needs to come to Belt Hoover, Mount Washington, the edge of Allentown to the site and station area. Um, but with that, I will now pass it over to our project manager, Rich Kojovic, to go over some of the details and planning process for our next steps. Thanks, James. Hi, everybody. Thanks for attending today. Um, great presentation so far by James, Elijah, Green, Moore. Thank you all. Um, if you could skip ahead to the next slide, please. I'll briefly discuss our timeline. So now we're wrapping up the discovery phase of the project. This is where we've collected, reviewed, and summarized a lot of data. Um, with that, we'll go ahead today and take your feedback and move on to the next stage, which is conceptual station area planning. Uh, during this following stage, our project team will develop two conceptual design scenarios for the South Hills Junction area plan. These scenarios will then be vetted within our eternal team and also with Port Authority leadership um, before holding another workshop mid-summer around mid-August. Following the summer workshop, our team will proceed with 10% conceptual design for a single unified scenario. In sticking with our planned three-month outreach schedule, we plan to hold our third and final round of engagement in mid-November before the holidays. And then following that last workshop, um, we'll go ahead and finalize our station area plan. Um, before we move ahead in our presentation here today, and as Elijah had noted, we have a, a pretty um, interesting public engagement and feedback tool we'd like to go through. More will be uh, giving a brief tutorial and explaining that process a bit. But before we get there, just wanted to check and, and see if there were any additional questions on the material that has been presented thus far today. Um, any general comments, if you could please hold those towards the end of the presentation. So for now, just if, if you need anything clarified on, on the presentation slides, you can uh, simply let us know or type in the chat window. All right, well, why don't we move on to our interactive mapping um, exercise. So I am sharing a link in the chat, which should take you to our social pinpoint map. Um, I'm gonna now share my screen and... Okay, so... What we are hoping to do with this tool, this is called Social Pinpoint. It's gonna be our kind of online community engagement platform for this project. Um, the first tool we're gonna to roll out is this interactive map. So we're hoping to today um, record the comments we hear from you directly onto the map kind of in real time. Um, we've also, as I said, dropped the link to the map in the chat. So if you would like to um, record your own comments during this meeting, you can, you can feel free to do that as well. Um, so I'll just kind of demonstrate how this works. So basically we have here highlighted in yellow, this is the site area of interest, but you can um, zoom, you know, zoom in and out as you wish to get it close or far away. Um, we do have in red the kind of half mile radius around the station. Um, we're hoping mostly for feedback about the, the area of interest, but if there are um, you know, things particularly related to access um, around the station, you know, the site area of interest, you can definitely feel free to drop a pen um, in that area as well. And so just really quick, pretty easy. Um, all of these markers represent kind of a different category. 
Um, so this this does pop up here on the left um, when it when you open the map, but you can get rid of it so you have more room to play around. Um, but so all of these just represent a category. So if, if there's something you like about the site, you can select this pin and drop it. If there is a particular um, challenge around access, you know, for pedestrians, bikes, drivers, transit riders, any of the above, um, you can use this category. Um, if there are any ADA access challenges, which we know there are many on this site, and we did create a specific marker for those um, challenges. Then we have one for safety concerns, which is, you know, do you feel unsafe at, in any specific part of the site? Is there a place where better lighting would be helpful? Things like that. Um, and then there is a, you know, design concern. This is, you know, where could things look better? You could even suggest some kind of public art somewhere. Um, things like that. And then, of course, we have a general sort of ideas and suggestions um, marker. So if not, you know, your comment doesn't fit into any of those categories, you can use this one. So this is pretty straightforward. You just select the one you want, click and then drag it to whatever spot kind of on the map you're wanting to comment on. Um, so just really quickly, as an example, you can write, you know, I love South Hills Junction. <laughs> um, you know, you could write that, but you might not. Um, and then just, uh, you, we are requiring your email just so you can, you know, get our confirmation from us. Um, and then you click agree to the, you know, that you agree your comment will be used and then add your comment and then it'll show up. Um, and then really quickly, these are info markers that you can click on. They're just meant to kind of highlight um, landmarks on the site. We have one for all of the access points that we discussed, all the, the stairs and um, just other ways of accessing the station. And we also have them for landmarks such as the salt shed, um, just to orient you on the site. Um, you can also, you can like or dislike these things. Um, you can even start a discussion. So if you wanted to, comment specifically on the salt shed you could write a comment here and people could reply to it um, and also quickly on these um, comments if you see something that you know somebody already put down but you were going to say the same thing instead of repeating it you could hit like um, so that's also a feature that we have so with that um, i think we decided that we are not going to break out into breakout rooms today just because we um, have a lot of people mostly on our project team and Port Authority reps. So I think it makes sense for us to stay together as a group um, for our discussion. Um, but James, um, since James will be operating the map, great, thank you. Um, yeah, so I think we basically just want to kind of open it up, start a discussion. Um, on kind of what your thoughts are on the site currently any or anything you heard today um, that you you know were surprised by or had questions on um, you know feel free to to chime in we could even start with a question about you know what do you see as the biggest access challenges on site um, maybe we could start there hey Mara this is Aaron um, I had a I, just a comment on the extensive excavation comment regarding the, the rail tie lay down area. Um, I think I mean, I, I'm glad that you guys identified it and definitely think it's a highly visible high potential, you know, area for a better use. Um, but I, I just, I don't think that that we should be in any way, you know, scared of something like you know excavation that would be a regular part of any sort of comprehensive redevelopment you know along with a phase one so you know just just a cautionary note that you know i don't think any site work should really be any any explanation for not doing something okay got it that's a good good feedback thank you Mara, this is Gordon at MWCDC. <clears throat> you know that um, Hilltop Alliance and MWCDC were very active in the development of the Smart Trid, and we've been hoping to do things over time. But this question really isn't related to that. 
Um, you were talking about connections with the neighborhoods. I get comment every once in a while about, you know, why sidewalks are closed, why sidewalks or you know, the access sidewalks are closed, why they're not necessarily in great condition and so on. Is this plan going to strongly examine, and I'm going to be biased, this, the, the pedestrian connections to Mount Washington? Yes, definitely. Um, that is a big part of um, what we hope to improve as part of this plan. It's perhaps the number one thing we're hoping to improve is just access to this site, especially for pedestrians. Um, we recognize there are a number of significant challenges currently. And so, um, you know, we did highlight several of them in the presentation, but yes, we're definitely very focused on um, improving access, you know, between Mount Washington, but also um, the other the other neighborhoods adjacent to the site as well. Mm -hmm. And I, I just like to add that, um, obviously there will be some pedestrian facilities that are um, under different ownership by other agencies, whether it's the city or PennDOT. So obviously, um, you know, those would have, would most likely have to be undertaken by those other agencies, but um, certainly anything within the site boundary or connections to the site, we'll be taking a hard look at those and, and we will identify some uh, pedestrian barriers offsite, but just a, you know, a quick note that we may not have direct control over improving anything that's offsite. Mara, are you familiar with the mobility hub concept that's been implemented, in, at least in theory, in many different neighborhoods in the city? This, yes. This, this is on. Uh, has there been discussion about trying to do something increasing alternate forms of mobility for South Hills Junction? Um, I mean, not specifically, but that's something we can certainly look at and discuss as part of the planning process if you have like any, you know, specific kind of ideas about that, we'd be happy to kind of record them and take them into consideration um, as we develop the plan. But it we haven't specifically um, talked about that yet, but we can talk about it today. <laughs> okay. If I, if I may build on that, you know, Port Authority has, um, uh, Breen's planning team has developed a first and last mile uh, plan or, or, or guidelines um, and um, you know, getting people to the station area, making that, you know, immediate station area connection really easy and, and convenient um, is, is outlined in that plan. Um, that plan doesn't go into the specifics that um, the station area plan can. And so I think that, you know, we're definitely uh, going to be pretty open-minded about what opportunities are here for, um, you know, getting into these neighborhoods. We recognize that, you know, the station platform is at the bottom of the valley, all of the homes and housing and business districts are at the top of the hill. That's a big connection to bridge, not just in length, but also vertically as well. And so making that making that easier is definitely a, a priority. And Seth Davis, I see you have your hand raised. Hi, thanks. I I'm kind of here representing South Hills Safe Streets. You know, we we've been looking for connections into the city or working on connections into the city, but I've, I've been through the station numerous times as a user, um, only once as a pedestrian accessing anything off. And so it's it's difficult because it's kind of that junction station and, and you've kind of highlighted all the things, but you hear things like Allentown always asking for the T to come back by. But I think, you know, a really important part is is the situation of Warrington Avenue. It, it is a kind of rough as a pedestrian closer to the station and the experiential element. I know it's off, off station, but anything that can improve that access, um, I know 51 is difficult from, you know, sort of the Southwest, but, and we've talked about seldom seen Greenway and the Wabash Tunnel as a pedestrian bike access, but I know the station tunnel can't really su probably support bike access, but anything that may be kind of that, what was touched on that last mile aspect, how can we, bring people to the station maybe by bikes and get them onto the trains and into the central business district downtown um, because Mount Washington's that biggest barrier for, for us in the South Hills if we were choosing to go by bike. So I just wanted to touch on that point. 
Got it. Thank you. That's great. Um, maybe James could put an access challenge um, on Warrington about about bikes, but we can also just we we also are generally taking notes on this. the The map is not the only way we're recording comments, <laughs> um, so we are recording everything that uh, we're hearing. But you can definitely put that on the map. Um, thank you for that. And so Gordon just provided some um, more information about the Move 412 Mobility Hub concept and a contact at the city for more information with that. Thanks, Gordon. I should mention something about development promoting, let's say improvements in neighborhood amenities. And I wanna say he was talking about sidewalk conditions and possibly some other things. And can he elaborate on that? And if I misinterpreted it, I apologize. Um, yeah, I can I can certainly elaborate on that. I think there, there are two ways in which development can uh, lead to improvements within a community. And I and I definitely advocate for um, you know development that is uh, uh, includes a very uh, inclusive and robust engagement process throughout planning and design uh, to make sure that you know the, the needs and the concerns of the community are addressed along the way. But in general, there are two ways that I think development can uh, can improve the conditions uh, in the surrounding area. Number one is that uh, if we were to develop, let's say, you know, about um, you know where that rail lay down area is. The development can include the improvement of that streetscape all along Warrington Avenue, including wider sidewalks, perhaps sidewalks with good tree coverage with uh, benches and trash cans and things like that. And so uh, the development itself can be an improvement within the neighborhood and it can include the immediate sidewalks and street conditions uh, along that development. But more broadly, um, you know, the, the smart trid the TRID part of that um, was evaluating, could we create a transit revitalization investment district, which is a tax increment um, kind of capture area where the additional taxation that comes with higher value development goes into a special fund that can be leveraged into improvements within the surrounding area up to three quarters of a mile away from the station area. Um, and so uh, this is what we have in East Liberty. East Liberty was the first one in the state. It took uh, I think 10 to 15 years after the legislation for TRID was created before East Liberty actually came along and used that legislation. And essentially the way it works is the new developments are worth more, therefore they pay more taxes. The difference between the original taxes and the new taxes goes into the special fund, which um, uh, allowed them because they saw they were anticipating this additional tax revenue in the future, they were able to uh, uh, get a, a low interest rate bond to make improvements and build things like the new bridge at East Liberty Station, uh, new sidewalks near East Liberty Station, new signage all along Highland Avenue. You have new lighting um, and well into you know parts of East Liberty and and uh, and even uh, on the edges of Larimer, there are improvements to intersections and crosswalks and things like that. And so um, you know certainly that mechanism could be utilized at Sail Hills Junction if the development prospects are really large enough uh, such that creating the district is, is really worthwhile. What was determined in 2011 was that, um, yeah, you could use TRID, but the market isn't ready for this scale of development. Uh, that's what they determined in 2011. What we may determine today um, in 2021, 10 years later, is that the market is, is in a different place, which it very much is. And so it may support enough development to where we could create that capture dif district, to where we could make improvements well beyond the station area um, in the surrounding communities. Uh, in, addition to make, in, in addition to investing in the hard infrastructure, sidewalks, lighting, um, at crosswalks, it can also uh, include funds for maintenance. So the East Liberty station area where that TRID exists, um, those the maintenance at the station area itself is paid for independently by the TRID fund. Um, 
And then in addition, it can be used uh, more flexibly uh, to help to subsidize affordable housing, uh, to potentially even be used like a lot of the URA's grant programs are used uh, to foster small businesses uh, and create grants or, or low interest loans perhaps um, that, that can help to uh, revitalize and, and support uh, uh, small businesses and affordable housing within the immediate station area. Um, so, you know, that it's, it's not something that we, um, it, it, it's not something that Port Authority would necessarily lead, although Port Authority would certainly be a, a very active participant and partner in that, uh, in the creation of a TRID. Um, you know, the, the district that we have here in Pittsburgh at East Liberty uh, is administered by an independent uh, group uh, with uh, kind of um, staffing and capacity provided by uh, the Urban Redevelopment Authority, the URA. So Eliza, and your estimates regarding the, the dollar value of investment due to um, repurposing the station, do you see that there's enough revenue to actually you know, justify the trade here? Uh, too early to say, um, and, and it's really going to be uh, Owen and his group um, with the with the community solutions group and the GAI consultants team who get into the nitty gritty of the economics of that. Um, I think that um, you, there's a lot of opportunity here, um, but to build on these sites, I think it was mentioned earlier, excavation will will certainly be necessary. It is a difficult site to build on. Difficult sites to build on mean that there's less leftover value uh, that can be captured for the community. Um, but I, I I do believe that there is a compelling case here where development at a certain scale um, could lead to quite substantial benefits for the surrounding community. Um, I think that there are, you know, there are a couple of concerns. You know, if if we put too much here, too much density, um, you know, it, it could be something that maybe isn't compatible with the surrounding neighborhood character, or maybe it, it doesn't feel quite right for the neighborhood. That's totally valid. Um, and, and I believe that, you know, residents and homeowners and, and, uh, and, and organizations like yours should have a say in, in shaping what that development is. If it's a mid-scale development, you know, the trade-off is maybe that mid-scale development isn't able to support all of the improvements we want in the surrounding community. It's, it's definitely, it's, uh, there's a lot of nuance to how we use that mechanism. Um, when you go to a different scale of development, the cost per square foot of that development is higher when, for, for a larger scale. Um, but you, there's more residual uh, and, and incremental value that can be uh, uh, kind of deviated from uh, the developer's pocket and into the communities. Um, so uh, it's, you know, I, I think a question that, that I would put out to everybody who's on this call, and certainly we'll, we'll talk about it uh, later this evening as well, is if we were to put some development on this site, what is the kind of development that, that you believe would make your community a better place? Would you be comfortable with something that is higher in density? Or is it really preferable to have something that's lower in density with maybe, you know, smaller scale retail and a different mix of residential. I'm really, really interested to hear, you know, what, what people could envision uh, being built on this site. Hi, Elijah, this is Seth Davis. I think you made a really good point at the end there. Well, I'm not in the community. I appreciated the proposal one from the TRID study where they kind of de-emphasize parking because right now it isn't really a park and ride lot. And I know users need parking, but um, just because of that return on investment, if you overbuild surface parking and especially structural parking, you really erode the potential for the community and potentially with that park and ride element, encourage more driving to an already um, impacted area where more cars on Warrington or more people accessing the site really kind of takes away what I think this group or the TRID study was pursuing for the site. 
That's that's a really great point. And in the past 10 years, there's been a lot of research into the value of park and ride facilities here in Allegheny County. Um, two, two things come to mind. One was a study by the Southwestern Pennsylvania Commission, which is the metropolitan planning um, organization for the, the 10 counties in Southwestern Pennsylvania. Their study determined that there are many park and ride facilities interior, really close to the city center, kind of interior to the city, where um, by having a park and ride facility at that location, more people, it, it actually increases the number of vehicle miles traveled in personal vehicles uh, because uh, people who could, would otherwise walk uh, or, or take their bike or, or whatnot are, are actually driving, you know, half a mile or three quarters of a mile to the station area. Um, in particular, we see that at, at Wilkinsburg. Uh, Wilkinsburg is one of the largest surface lots we have in the county, um, and it's a location where, you know, 60% of, approximately of the people who park in that lot are actually from that zip code. And so it's it's people who could otherwise potentially walk or or bike or use some other method to get to the station area. They're driving their cars to the station area. Um, and so in a separate study that was uh, performed uh, by the Port Authority, specifically looking at the park and ride lot at, at Wilkinsburg, it was determined that um, it's actually more value. There's more value for the Port Authority if that lot were to be developed than if they were to keep it as a, a convenient free parking lot uh, for riders. Um, so, you know, the, the 2011 TRID study um, here at South Hills Junction, they didn't have those, those two kind of data points, those two ways of thinking uh, to, uh, to inform their planning process. And I think that a lot of people at the time were in the, who lived in the community were concerned about people doing uh, hide and ride, uh, where people would drive from other neighborhoods, park on the street, and then walk to the station area. And so I think that there was, a, there was definitely an appetite in 2011 uh, for uh, a potential park and ride facility, structured park and ride facility at South Hills Junction. Um, today, we are, uh, you know, our team is not looking at a, a park and ride facility here. Um, you know, the parking that, that we would be considering, um, you know, for this site uh, would be either for uh, employee parking for the Port Authority, potentially. Um, there are a lot of maintenance facilities that remain on this site or could remain on this site. Um, or uh, you know, the necessary parking uh, to potentially support development. But I think we're going to err on the side of building less parking. Uh, parking is not uh, a revenue generator for the Port Authority. It's not a revenue generator for the developer. It costs a lot of money to build. Uh, and that money that, um, that it costs to build is not being used uh, for a lot of the other improvements that need to be made here. Um, and so we're going to be as conservative as we can uh, when, when thinking about the number of parking spaces that we need. Thanks, Elijah. Um, I just wanted to highlight um, some comments in the chat. So Allison wrote that um, I'd love to see Port Authority partner with the Housing Authority as they have the ability to do tax-free for-profit housing. And this would be a great opportunity to offer social housing where all residents pay around 25% of their income in rent. Rates for the highest incomes can be offered if it's a concern. And the mix allows the development to break even and self-support outside of the existing federal housing subsidy programs. If no parking was offered, it would complement the existing housing stock as people could move between them if their car ownership changes. Um, so the Housing Authority of, the, of Pittsburgh and the county need more pushes to do these kinds of projects. So basically an idea of uh, partnering with the Housing Authority to do um, some, some affordable housing scheme on site. Um, that's certainly something not, you know, necessarily the partnership with the housing authority, but certainly affordable housing is something that we are strongly um, looking at for this site as far as proposed uses. Um, we, you know, in our TOD guidelines, affordability is one of our major um, goals and principles. So it's something that um, really drives our work and something that we recognize as um, probably a big need in this, in this area. Um, so I definitely appreciate that comment. Thank you. Um, so kind of building off of that, are there any um, other sort of like specific uses that, you know, were transit oriented development to, you know, to take place on the site that you think the community might see? Um, so just, you know, Elijah had asked the question about density, but I guess I'm more curious about specific types of uses that 
um, you know, you think the community might might benefit from. I, Mara, I definitely think housing is, uh, I mean, is going to be a piece of anything if if it is put out to an RFP. I mean, I'm just not sure how you could do the site work that would be needed for, you know, commercial without having at least, you know, multi-level, you know, with housing above. So, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that that's there's really an option there if we're talking about comprehensively developing these these parcels and they're also uh, you know in the same line i mean they're too they're there's just too much work to be done to do single family as well you know so i don't think it could be a one level option either um so i don't i, I guess i don't really know what i'm saying other than maybe that we should all just be cautious that that the options are realistic, you know, for folks, um, because, you know, because of that site work cost. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So build, building on that just, just a little bit, um, and uh, because the, the density question is, there's, there's a lot packed into that. Uh, one of the things that, that is packed into that is, you know, given a higher site work cost, um, you know, a, a larger, denser building uh, will allow for that cost to be spread over a larger number of units. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, it, lower density, certainly single family uh, projects would, would not be uh, really feasible for this site. Um, given all of the site work that has to be done. Um, there are examples of a couple of different densities that we have here in the city. In East Liberty, you're looking at what is a, a, a kind of four over one or five over one podium uh, style development. Um, you know, that is a specific technology that is, you know, generally affordable to, to deploy. Um, uh, in Oakland, we have you know, kind of the next scale of that, which is, uh, you know, there are a couple of buildings that are in the 12 to 16 story range. Um, and, uh, you know, that, you know, when you go above six stories, it triggers a, a, a different kind of construction, uh, which then, um, you know, comes comes with, you know, higher costs that, that have to be spread over a certain number of units. Um, and so I guess, you know, would we be comfortable here, you know, not not knowing what those site work costs are, do you think that people could be comfortable with something at that higher level of scale, or should we try to make the mid-level of scale, um, the uh, kind of five to six story range, should we try to make the, the mid-level work here? Um, you know, what, what, what are the tolerances? This is Gordon. I think you'd find the communities more accepting of a mid-level density as opposed to a high level or high you know height project i think that's just the reality i have a totally unrelated question that is is there a need for site remediation Well, um, James might be able to answer yeah. that. <laughs> uh, so that's one of the things that will have to be investigated. Uh, that was what we were kind of discussing when we we're talking about extensive excavation when it comes to the rail tie laydown area is the possibility of remediation as there is obviously rail ties there and we have uh, some materials such as creosote that could have penetrated into the soil. Um, so that's something that would have to be investigated separate from this plan specifically, but it will be a recommendation for any potential development uh, to obviously have that, uh, that environmental study completed. Uh, but that is just the economic kind of thing we were discussing when we we're talking about excavation at that site, just because there is the possibility that you have to over excavate in order to develop. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another observation is that, at least in terms of the residents of Mount Washington or Western Mount Washington, my perception is they'd love to have a mini commercial area here that serves some of their needs, like daily needs, let's say. And Allison's comment in the um, chat kind of like reinforces that a bit 
because people just really they don't want to walk to Main Street, Main, Main Drag, Allentown from you know five or six or eight blocks away. They just don't want to do it. And it would be really interesting, and maybe Aaron has some of this information about um, you know who actually patronizes the businesses along East Warrington. Is it mostly Allentown residents, or are they destination visitors, or you know otherwise? I would love to have that information. And then my last point, and I'm going to shut up for the rest of the meeting, <laughs> is I'm a big fan of flex space. You know, flex you know, space that you can be that can be used for multiple different purposes. My understanding is it costs more upfront, but it enables you to do multiple things down the road um, rather than you know tear down. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. That's something for us to look into um, for sure. For um, so, you know, some proposed uses on the site. And it, yeah, thank you for highlighting um, Allison's comment. I did want to highlight that in the chat. Um, uh, so, you know, as far as a proposed use here, something or anything on Warrington that would activate the street, commercial, et cetera. It's such a slog to walk from the station to the existing commercial area. So yes, thank you for that. That seems to be a common, um, common wish. Then Aaron says the height question is a good one to pull participants in these sessions. Um, so they, are you just um, saying that asking people's preferences on height or do you want to elaborate a little bit on that, Aaron? Yeah, just I don't think it's too soon to start talking about that. Okay. You know, just to, I mean, it doesn't have to be a binary question, but just, you know, to, to get a sense. I mean, and what, Lost you, Aaron. Yeah, sorry, I think I froze there. Um, yeah, and and I think I see another Allison comment about should veto or shouldn't have a veto or something. Yeah, I mean, I think that's true. I guess my next question along that line is though, what the rezoning would have to be. It would, you know, would it have to be go through some planned development? you know, zoning process, because if so, I mean, you're going to need buy-in from people within, you know, the 500 foot radial distance who could otherwise show up and, you know, speak against it at the actual zoning hearing. So we yeah, no need matter, some level of buy-in. No matter what density of potential development here, there will need to be a rezoning because it's currently zoned as park. This is a site that has never been conceived of up until the smart trip uh, as, as being a site that could be occupied by buildings. Yeah, really interesting stuff about zoning for sure. Um, so we have about four minutes left um, in our meeting. Um, so are there any other, are there any kind of final thoughts or questions, ideas from the group? If not, I just want to, um, I want to drop the link to the map again in the chat so people have it kind of readily available to them. Um, this site is live, as you can see, and we will be sharing it widely for people to um, comment. We'll be collecting comments here for the next, you know, several weeks uh, that will inform our um, conceptual design for the next phase in the project. Um, we also do have another uh, meeting tonight, same exact presentation. Um, same uh, same deal. So that's at six tonight from six thirty to eight o'clock. It's the same um, Zoom link that was used for this meeting. So if you um, wanted to join that one again or, or know anybody who's interested um, in that meeting, please feel free to share that link with them. We'll also be um, sending it out to our stakeholder list again. But um, we will be having a second session tonight at six thirty. Um, so just wanted to point that out and. There's nothing else. I want to open the floor one more time just to make sure there's nothing else. Okay. Hey, Mara. Yeah. This is Gordon. Is it mm -hmm. possible to get your email address? Because I would have sent you something about May 20th community forum in, in, in Mount Washington where you're speaking, but I couldn't because I don't have it. <laughs> and my email is in the chat. All right. Everybody should have it now. 
Um, yeah, great. Well, thank you so much um, for participating, everybody. And we will be in touch. I will, I will send also, we'll send a follow-up email with the link to this and to um, our site, which will be built out and uh, with the presentation and meeting recordings on it as well to share with people who weren't able to attend. So thanks so much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.